During the days of Jeconiah, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar laid siege to Jerusalem and eventually overwhelming her defenses and taking captive King Jeconiah, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from Jerusalem and into Babylon. He took the king and all the nobles with him. As the following reference reads and reads, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took not, when he carried away captive Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from Jerusalem to Babylon, and all the nobles of Judah and Jerusalem. You see, fam. It's important to note that the royal Yaya Negroes of Spain and Portugal trace their lineage back to this very same King Jeconiah, son of King Jehoiakim, King of Judah. In fact, their lineage can be traced all the way back to King David or Daoud. And in this reference fam, you can see a genealogy of the Yaya Negroes going all the way back to King David, which you can find on the top left under Roman numeral two, where you'll see David. And then also under Roman numeral two, near the bottom of that section, you'll see Jehoiakim, and you'll also see his son, Jeconiah. Now, it's also important to stress that it was the descendants of the king of Judah who were called the Yayas, who were also called Negroes. In other words, fam, the word Negro, it literally traces back to the descendants of King David or King Daoud. As the following reference reads and reads, Yaya, a Portuguese family of the Middle Ages, members of which were prominent in Portugal, Spain, Italy, and Turkey. Certain individuals of the family bore the additional cognomen Negro with reference to the Moors from whom several of their estates had been obtained. The more prominent members of the family are as follows. Yahya Ibn Yaish, flourished in Lisbon in the 11th century, died about 1150. He was held in high esteem among the Jews and King Alfonso I honored him for his courage. After the conquest of Santirum, the king presented him with two country houses that had belonged to the Moors. Wherefore, he assumed the name Negro. Hallelujah. So you see, fam, not only were the descendants of Jehoiakim or Jeconiah in Spain, according to their genealogy, but we also see that they themselves stated that they were from the house of Judah, from the lineage of King David. As the following reference reads and reads, the Spanish Jew are the true descendants from the tribe of Judah and the royal house of David, and were settled in Spain from the time of the captivity of the first temple by Nebuchadnezzar. And the next reference reads and reads, the Western Jews pretend moreover that some of the most considerable families of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin went and settled in Sephard or Spain. And the next reference reads and reads, but to come to rabbinical authors, Abarbanel, in his commentary on Zechariah, the Lord also shall save the tents of Judah, affirms that at the desolation of the first temple, two families of the house of David came and settled in Spain, 
one at Lucina and the other, the Abarbanels, at Seville. And from these came a thousand offshoots. And on the right side of the page it reads, at a conference held in Aragon before the anti-pope in 1414, this number was also given by the Jews. A Barbanel afterwards gave the same number but divided it into 40,000 families of Judah and 10,000 families of Benjamin and the priests. The scepter of Judah still later says that the number of Israel brought out of all Palestine into Spain at that time exceeded the number of those brought out of Egypt by Moses. And the next reference reads and reads, King Alonso, whence we may learn if we can believe it, that a king of Spain who had assisted Nebuchadnezzar in reducing Jerusalem brought an enormous population into Spain, all from either the family of David or at least from the tribe of Judah, and that the royal family resided first in Seville, then in Granada, adding that the exiles afterwards had their numbers greatly increased by fugitives from the desolation of the second temple. Family. Reference after reference, page after page, shows that the Spanish and Portuguese Bruce stated that they were descended from the house of Judah and descendant from King David. As the next reference reads and reads, the Spanish Jews maintained that they had been transported hither after the destruction of the temple by the Babylonian conqueror Nebuchadnezzar. Certain Jewish families, the Ibn Dauds and the Abarbanels, boasted descent from the royal house of David and maintained that their ancestors had been settled since time immemorial, partly in the district of Lucina and partly in the environs of Toledo and Seville. And the next reference reads and reads, how numerously the Jews had settled in some parts of Spain is shown by the names which they conferred upon the localities. The city of Granada was called the city of the Jews in former times on account of its being entirely inhabited by them. Jumping ahead to the right side of the page, it reads, the numerous Spanish Jewish family of Nasi, which means prince in Hebrew, also traced back its pedigree to King David and proved it by means of a genealogical table and seals. The family Alabalias was more modest and dated its immigration only from the destruction of the second temple. And family tradition runs to the effect that the Roman governor of Spain begged the conqueror of Jerusalem to send him some noble families from the capital of Judea, which is the territory of Judah, and that Titus complied with his request. <laughs> and yes, as you can see fam, reference after reference, quote after quote, shows the Brubes of Spain and Portugal consistently self-identifying as the house of Judah, self-identifying as the descendants of King David. However, even with all this information, there are those who would attempt to override and redefine the testimony of the Brews of Spain and Portugal and remake these Israelites from being of the house of Judah into being of the tribe of Ephraim. This is done by what I refer to as the Ephraim deception. What is the Ephraim deception, you ask? Well, it goes a little something like this. In a time long, long ago, in a place far, far away, there was a great king named King David, who wasn't from the tribe of Judah. Instead, he was from the tribe of Ephraim. And not only was King David from the tribe of Ephraim, so was the Messiah. That's right. They believed that our Messiah, Yahushua, was from the tribe of Ephraim. Not only that, the Brews of Spain and Portugal were also believed to be from the tribe of Ephraim. And these Spanish and Portuguese sons of Ephraim eventually crossed over from Spain and Portugal into Morocco and eventually became a people called the Imokoyim, who became the Yoruba, who then became called African Americans. Because according to this belief, 
the Most High chose Ephraim over Judah. Whoa, 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 hold up. Family, are you serious? Okay, let's take it to the book. Okay fam, well let's take a look at these deceptions one deception at a time. And with that, let's start with deception number one. The Most High chose Ephraim over Judah? Well, let's see if that's correct. Please open your Bibles to the book of Psalms chapter 78 verses 65 through 70. That's Psalms chapter 78 verse 65 through 70. Reads. Then Yahuwah awaken as one out of sleep, and like a mighty man that shouteth by reason of wine. And he smote his enemies in the hinder parts. He put them to a perpetual reproach. Verse 67. Moreover, he refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim. Verse 68. But chose the tribe of Judah the Mount Zion which he loved. And he built his sanctuary like high places, like the earth which he has established forever. He chose David also his servant and took him from the sheepfolds. From following the ewes great with young, he brought him to feed Jacob his people and Israel his inheritance. Hallelujah. As you can see fam, verse 67 tells us that Yahuwah refused the tabernacle of Joseph and chose not the tribe of Ephraim. Then in verse 68 he tells us that he chose the tribe of Yehuda, the Mount Zion which he loved, and chose David his servant. Family, there is no wonder why we find the word of Ephraim written in the Bible roughly 162 times while we find the word Judah written in the Bible 755 times in the Holy Book. And also note fam, of the 162 times that Ephraim is mentioned in the Bible, that in none of those instances does King David or King Solomon, who was the wisest man on earth, neither of them mention that they were from the tribe of Ephraim. Which leads us to the second deception. Deception number two. King David was from the tribe of Ephraim. To check this deception, let's look at the words of King David himself. Let's see if King David tells us if he's from the house of Judah or if he's from the house of Ephraim. Let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 28 verses 1 through 5. That's 1 Chronicles chapter 28 verses 1 through 5 reads, and David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by course, and the captains over the thousands and the captains over hundreds, and the stewards over all the substance and the possessions of the king, and of his sons with the officers and with the mighty men, and with all the valiant men unto Jerusalem. Listen, fam, it says, then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant for Yahuwah, for the footstool of our Allah, and had made ready for the building. But Allah said unto me, Thou shalt not build a house for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. Verse 4. Howbeit that Yahuwah Elua of Israel chose me before all the house of my father to be king over Israel forever. For he has chosen Judah to be the ruler. And of the house of Judah, the house of my father, and among the sons of my father, 
he liked me to make me king over all of Israel. Hallelujah. So as you can see, fam, King David himself tells us that the Most High Yahuwah chose Judah to be the ruler. And he also tells us that Judah is the house of his father, who is Jesse. Family, the scriptures are clear. King David tells us in all of Israel that he is from the house of Judah. All right, well, let's take a look at the genealogies of both King David and Yahushua in the 1611 King James Bible. As the following reference reads, and reads, the genealogies of Holy Scriptures. To the Christian reader, the Spirit of God in the sacred history hath laid down such helps as are the light and life of all nations' originals. In them the circumstances of person, time, and place are the chief. Else do we wonder as without a guide. And of these the person is principal. Genealogies then drawn from them, from whom all are descendant, and by God's own warrant recorded unto us, must move a special reverence that they are holy, and far from those other against which St. Paul writeth, among whose manifold use this is the chiefest, that by them is proved how Christ was made very man. And therefore, in several tables, they are here exhibited even from their first root, and so continue through their spreading branches, so far as the scripture giveth them sap. In the reading thereof, let these few directions be thy guides. Now, we're going to skip all the way down to number six, which reads, The lineage of our blessed Savior, which is our principal scope, is known by a chain-like trail continued from Adam to Shem, and thence to Terah and Abraham. So likewise from David to his son Solomon and Nathan, and lastly to our Savior's parents, linked together as other marriages here are by the sculpture of an hand in hand, both descended from Zerubbabel, as the holy evangelists have recorded from David, Judah, and Abraham, as Moses and the prophets have spoken, and the Jews themselves thus far grant that the Messiah should be the son of a virgin, her name Mary, and she of Bethlehem, the daughter of Eli, of the house of Zerubbabel, and the tribe of Judah. And all which our Christ is manifestly designed, and by these Jews both acknowledged to have been of the blood royal, and also recorded in the number of the priests in their public register at Jerusalem. By this title, Yahushua the son of the living God, and of the Virgin Mary. Thus is he David's son, and Abraham's heir, in whom all kindreds of the earth are blessed, being of the very image of the invisible God, the brightness of the glory, and the engraven form of his person, in whom dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and unto whom be ascribed all glory, praise, wisdom, thanks, power, and might, forever and ever. Amen. And now let's take a look at the genealogy found in the 1611 King James Bible of King David and Yahushua, and notice that both are written to be of the tribe of Judah.
family. Let's review the lineage of King David illustrated in the 1611 King James Bible. And by the way, have you ever wondered how the Negroes of Spain and Portugal scattered to the four corners of the world, how they are related to Hamashia? <laughs> well, let's take a look. fam well let's begin by first taking a look at the sons of king david this is where we can find the lineage of yahushua and the spanish and portuguese sons of judah called negroes as you can see the lineage of hamashiach is represented by a chain linked line going from king david to his son nathan the lineage of the spanish and portuguese brews on the other hand goes back to King David's son Solomon. In other words fam, Yahushua Hamashiach is the great uncle of the Yahya Negroes. Not only that, when we look at the forefather of King David, we see that King David is the son of Jesse, and that Jesse is the son of Obed, and that Obed is the son of Boaz. And if you know fam, Boaz married Ruth. This is where we find the next Ephraim deception, which states that Boaz is the descendant of Ephraim. Now, the justification for this assertion centers around the book of Ruth, in particular, chapters one and two. You see fam, in the book of Ruth, chapter one, we find a family of Bethlehem Judah called Ephrathites, as the following reference reads and reads. Now it came to pass in the days when the judge ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. Verse two, and the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malhan and Selion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. You see, these men from Bethlehem Judah were called Ephrathites which is Strong's H673, that's Strong's H673, which means a descendant of Ephraim, also an inhabitant of Ephrath. This family is the foundation of the assertion that Boaz and King David are of the genealogy of Ephraim because of his kinsmen, AKA brethren, were called Ephrathites, which means the descendant of Ephraim. However, fam, the mistake that most people make at this point is that they don't keep reading the book of Ruth all the way through chapter 4. Why do they need to read through chapter 4? Well, because chapter 4 explicitly explains the genealogy of Boaz without question. In fact, the book of Ruth chapter 4 goes as far as to fully explain the full lineage of Boaz all the way back to Judah. There's no way around it, fam. And with that said, let's continue reading the book of Ruth, chapter 4. Now, I'm going to start at Ruth, chapter 4, verse 9, and read down so that we can get the context of what's happening in this part of the scripture. Now, Boaz is purchasing Elimelech's and Sileon's and Malhan's possessions, along with purchasing Ruth to be his wife. Then, we're going to keep reading to see which tribe the book of Ruth says that Boaz is from. As the following reference reads and reads, and Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, you are witnesses this day 
that I have bought all that is Elimelech's and all that is Salion's and Malhan's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malhan, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place. You are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. Yahuwah, make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel. And do thy worthily in Ephrata, and be famous in Bethlehem. Now notice, fam, it's talking about Ephrata, right? All right. Now let's keep reading to see what tribe the book of Ruth says these men are from. Verse 12 reads, and let thy house be like the house of Pharaoh, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which Yahuwah shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, Yahuwah gave her conception, and she bare a son. Verse 14, And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be Yahuwah, has not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, has borne him. Verse 16. And Naomi took the child and laid it upon her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse the father of David. Here we go, fam. We're going to read verse 18 on down to see what tribe Boaz is from. And here he goes. It says, Now these are the generations of Pharaohs. Pharaohs beget Hezron. Hezron beget Ram. Ram beget Amenadab. And Amenadab beget Nashon. Nashon beget Salmon. And Salmon beget Boaz. And Boaz beget Obed. And Obed beget Jesse. And Jesse begat David. Now, you may have missed it, fam, but in verse 18, you'll see the name of Pharaoh. There it says, remember, it says, now these are the generations of Pharaoh, and it says, Pharaoh begat Hezron. Guess what, fam? You have to know who Pharaoh is to know what tribe these men are from. I'll give you the short answer, fam. Pharaoh is literally the son of Judah. Hallelujah. You see, fam, Ruth chapter one may have explained what the kinsmen or the brethren of Boaz were called. However, Ruth chapter four shows you who Boaz's daddy was. Hallelujah. And now, just to be sure that Pharaoh is literally the son of Judah, let's read about it in Genesis chapter 46, verse 12 reads, And the sons of Judah, Ur and Onan, Shelah and Pharaoh. Hallelujah. And the next reference reads, and it reads, First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 1. The sons of Judah, Pharaoh, Hezron, Carmi, and Ur, and Shobal. Matthews chapter 1 verse 1 reads, The book of the generation of Yahushua Hamashiach, the son of Daud, and the son of Abraham. Abraham beget Isaac, Isaac beget Jacob, and Jacob beget Judas and his brethren, and Judas beget Pharaoh. Let's keep reading, fam. It says, And Zara of Tamar, and Pharaoh beget Esram, and Esram beget Aram, and Aram beget Amenadab, and Amenadab beget Nasan, and Nasan beget Salem, and Salem beget Boaz. It says Boaz, but it's Boaz of Rachab. And Boaz beget Obed of Ruth. And Obed beget Jesse. And let's also confirm Pharaoh is the son of Judah using the 1611 King James Bible genealogy illustration. And as you can see, fam, at the top, it says Judah. You can see, fam, that over to the right with Tamar, there's a chain link line going down, and that represents the lineage of Hamashiach. And you can see that the lineage of Hamashiach goes into Pharaoh. Hallelujah. All right, fam. So now that we know that Pharaoh is the son of Judah, now we can go back and read Ruth chapter 4 
verses 18 through 22 to see that these verses have zero wiggle room in regards to the lineage of Boaz. As far as this lineage is concerned, Boaz is of the lineage of Judah. Ruth chapter 4 verse 18 reads, Now these are the generations of Pharaz. Pharaz beget Hezron, and Hezron beget Ram. Ram beget Amminadab, and Amminadab beget Nashon. And Nashon beget Salem, and Salem beget Boaz. And Boaz beget Obed, and Obed beget Jesse, and Jesse beget David. Hallelujah. All right, fam. So you see, fam, instead of simply reading Boaz's Judah genealogy found in Ruth 4, the Ephraim deception focuses on scriptures which identify Elimelech as Ephraim. Then it focuses on verses that associate Boaz with Elimelech. And therefore, by that reason, if Elimelech is Ephraim, then they believe that Boaz is Ephraim. In other words, the Ephraim deception uses an implied genealogy instead of the genealogy explicitly defined in Ruth chapter four. You see, Ruth chapter four, we know who Boaz's father is. However, we don't know who Boaz is in relation to Elimelech. In other words, Ruth does not tell the reader if Boaz is Elimelech's son, father, brother, first cousin, second cousin, or a Israelite from Judah related through marriage. Boaz's family link to Elimelech isn't defined in those terms. Instead, one would have to guess based on the interpretation of the following verses. Let's take a look at Ruth chapter 2 verse 1 reads, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Now, unfortunately, fam, some people use this verse to say that Boaz is a descendant of Ephraim because it refers to Boaz as a kinsman and being of the family of Elimelech. The mistake here, fam, is that some of our brothers and sisters don't take the time to look up the words kinsman or the phrase of the family of Elimelech in the Strong's Concordance. You see, fam, Strong's will show you what these words mean. For example, let's look up the word kinsman that we see in Ruth chapter 2 verse 1, which is Strong's H4129. That's Strong's H4129, which means acquaintance? An acquaintance? Wait a minute. Now, that's different than what some westernized people would think in their mind when they hear kinsman. This is why, fam, you have to look these words up in Strong's. Let's continue, fam. Let's look up the phrase of the family of Elimelech. Now that would be Strong's H4940. That's Strong's H4940, which is Mishpachah, <laughs> hallelujah. Which of course means family, circle of relatives, a class, a species, sort, a tribe, or a people. So as you can see, fam, it has multiple meanings. So based on Strong's fam, let's take what we've learned about the meaning of these words and insert those into Ruth chapter two, verse one. And let's read it, it says, and Naomi had an acquaintance of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, a family, circle of relatives, a class, a species, a tribe, or people of Elimelech. And his name was Boaz. Do you see fam how the verse reads different when you use the Strong's concordance meaning of the word? Well, let's keep going, fam. Let's take another verse. Let's look up Ruth chapter 3, verse 12, which reads, Now it is true that I am thy near kinsman, howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I. Now notice the phrase near kinsman. Now before we go putting Boaz on the Ephraim bus, let's look up this word in the Strong's Concordance to see the true meaning. So this would be Strong's H1350. That's Strong's H1350, which means to redeem, act as kinsman. Hmm, to redeem, act as kinsman, it sounds like a redeemer. All right, fam, now let's read Ruth chapter three, verse 12, using the Strong's definition. And it reads, and now it is true that I am your redeemer, howbeit that there is a redeemer nearer than I. Now, doesn't that verse read differently when using the Strong's definition? 
And just to keep things consistent, fam, let's go on to the book of Ruth chapter 4, verse 18, which shows the actual genealogy of Boaz. Let's look up this verse in Strong's to see if the verse reads differently. So Ruth chapter 4, verse 18, and it reads, Now these are the generations of Pharaz. Pharaz beget Hezron. Now generations is Strong's H8435. That's Strong's H8435. Three, five, and it reads descent, family, history. And let's also look up beget, right? Because it says, because it says Pharez beget Hezron. So let's make sure beget means beget, right? So that's Strong's H3205. That's Strong's H3205, which reads to bear young, to beget, medically, to act as a midwife, to show lineage. Now let's do the same exercise we did with the previous two verses and insert the Strong's meaning into this verse. And it reads, now these are the descent the family, the history of Pharaz. Haran bear young, beget, medically act as a midwife, show lineages of Haran. As you can see fam, when we look up Ruth chapter 4 verse 18 using Strong's, the meaning of the verse remains intact. It doesn't change as seen in the previous verses. This is why we point people to Ruth chapter 4 verse 18 through 22 to search out the genealogy of Boaz, who's the great, 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 great grandson of Judah. Oh, and fam, one major point often overlooked when discussing Ephraim and Judah, and that is Ephraim and Judah were bitter enemies. You see, Ephraim represented the northern kingdom and Judah represented the southern kingdom. And in the scriptures, the northern and southern kingdoms were constantly at war with one another, with Ephraim joining up with Judah's enemies in an attempt to overthrow the kingdom of Judah and the house of David.
Isaiah chapter 7 verse 1 reads and it came to pass in the days of Oz the son of Jotham the son of Uziah king of Judah that Rezin the king of Syria and Pekah the son of Remaliah king of Israel went up toward Jerusalem to war against it but could not prevail against it and it was told the house of David saying Syria is confederate with Ephraim and his heart was moved and the heart of his people as the trees of the wind are moved with the wind then saith Yahuwah unto Isaiah go forth now to meet Oz thou and Sherajashim thy son at the end of the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the foolish field and say unto them take heed and be quiet fear not neither be faint-hearted for the two tails of these smoking firebrands for the fierce anger of Rezin with Syria and the son of Remaliah because Syria Ephraim and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee saying let us go up against Judah and vex it and let us make a breach therein for us and set a king in the midst of it even the son of Tabeel thus says Yahuwah it shall not stand neither shall it come to pass now notice Ephraim wanted to replace the house of David verse 6 let's go up against Judah and vex it and let us make a breach thereon for us and set a king in the midst of it now keep in mind fam the house of David was already ruling in Jerusalem so when Ephraim says let us set a king in the midst of it they are saying let us replace the house of David so it goes without saying fam Ephraim was against Judah Isaiah chapter 9 verse 21 Manasseh Ephraim and Ephraim and Manasseh and they together shall be against Judah for all this his anger is not turned away but his hand is stretched out still first Kings chapter 15 verse 4 reads nevertheless for David's sake did Yahuwah Alua give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem because David did that which was right in the size of Yahuwah and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life save only the matter of Uriah the Hittite and there was war between Rehoboam southern kingdom and Jeroboam northern kingdom all the days of his life now for the rest of the acts of Abijam and all that he did are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah and there was war between Abijam and Jeroboam so according to scripture fam the conflict between Judah and Ephraim would rage on until the last days until Judah was regathered from the four corners of the earth and Ephraim's envy of Judah departs and Judah stops vexing Ephraim Isaiah chapter 11 verse 13 reads and it shall come to pass in that day that Yahuwah shall set his hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the isles of the sea. Verse 12. And he shall set up an ensign for the nation and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy of Ephraim shall depart. You see, fam? And it says, And the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines towards the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom, and Moab and the children of Ammon shall obey them. Now, when Judah and Ephraim finally comes together, it will mean the destruction of the Philistines and the, and the Edomites and Moab and Ammon. Until then, Ephraim and Judah, they're not going to get along, fam. So, and this is why when we see Ephraim migrate to Morocco during ancient times, then we see Judah in Spain and Portugal when they are expelled from Spain and they flee into Morocco where Ephraim is. We know, fam, it's about to go down. 
And unfortunately, fam, as expected, we see Judah began to be persecuted in Morocco, forcing Judah to flee further south or deeper south into Africa, into Negro land. As the following reference reads, and it reads, the Jews were more numerous in Fez, now Fez is a city in Morocco, it says, the Jews were more numerous in Fez than in any city in Barbary. A traveler who visited the country in 1619, hmm, is that date again, reckoned 80,000 in this province, some of whom were very affluent and powerful. They have guards at the entrance of their quarter to enable them to carry on commerce without being molested and are permitted to exercise their religion. But though they have a chief of their own nation, they are exposed to all kinds of oppressions from the Mohammedan. If you don't know, fam, the Moors were Mohammedans. Let's keep reading. It says, this people, however, have frequently suffered from tyranny and caprice of the arbitrary sovereigns of Morocco. Now notice fam, it says the sovereigns of Morocco. Judah was being persecuted by the sovereigns of Morocco. So let's take a look to see who was running Morocco during this time. And for that, let's go to the Jewish virtual library to read the highlighted area, which reads, according to Judean African tradition, Ophrin is regarded as the first site of Jewish settlement in Morocco. Many legends have been created about the ancient community of Ophrin, whose first members are said to have arrived from Erez, Israel, before the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem. A Jewish kingdom was set up there which was governed by the Afrat family, then named Afrati. The Jews of this kingdom are said to have belonged to the tribe of Ephraim, one of the ten tribes of Israel. Indeed, in the modern area, the Afrat family administered the affairs of the community of Ephron and of all the communities of the region. So you see fam, it was Ephraim that was running portions of Morocco where Judah was being persecuted. And oddly enough fam, on the west coast of Africa, on the slave coast, which is called the kingdom of Judah, where 150 towns of Judah were located, we also see a village of Ephraim where Judah was sold as slave. You have to ask yourself, family, what's Ephraim doing in the place where the tribe of Judah was sold as slaves? And the following reference reads and reads, the old writers called it Judah, and its inhabitants were said to be Jews, while the neighboring river Alala, whose real name is Ephra, became the Euphrates. During the flourishing days of the slave trade from 16 to 18,000 were annually transported from a Judah as the Portuguese called this place. And yes, fam, I Judah in Portuguese means help. And also fam, I Judah also means Judah. Now let's keep reading fam where it says, 18,000 were annually transported from I Judah as the Portuguese called this place, which at the time had a population of 35,000. Now family, just to reiterate, remember Isaiah 9 verse 21, Manasseh, Ephraim, Ephraim, Manasseh, and they together shall be against Judah. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. There will be a time when Ephraim and Judah set aside the differences to come together. However, according to prophecy, that will not occur until around the time Judah is gathered from the four corners of the earth. This is why, fam, attempting to remake the brews of Spain and Portugal into the sons of Ephraim, why that's an egregious error, which is indeed another Ephraim deception. And so maybe you're thinking, OK, OK, I, I see the Eve narrative is indeed a deception. And however, my brother, at the end of the day, does it really matter? Well, to answer that question, let's take a look at the prophecies concerning Judah. Let's see if it matters if you're Judah or if you swap out your Judah card for something else. Let's start with the book of Zechariah, verse 12. And let's start with verse one, which reads the burden of the word of Yahuwah for Israel said, Yahuwah which stretch forth the heavens, layeth the foundations of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within. Verse 2 Behold, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome cup of trembling unto all people round about, when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut to pieces though all the people of the earth shall be gathered together against them. In that day, says Yahuwah, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah. 
and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. Verse 5, now listen fam, it says, And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength, and Yahuwah Zabaot, our Lua. And that day I will make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheath, and they shall devour all the people round about on the right and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. Verse 7, And Yahuwah also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. Joel chapter 3 verse 1 reads, For behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. Yea, what have you to do with me, O Tyre and Zidon and all the coasts of Palestine? Will you render me a recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? Because you have taken my silver and my gold and carried into your temples my goodly pleasant things. Verse 6. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold unto the Grecians. So family, who was sold to the Grecians, fam? The descendants of the Grecians. It says the children of Judah. Let's keep reading. It says that you might remove them far from their border. Verse 7. Behold, I will raise them out of the place where the you have sold them and will return your recompense upon your own head. And I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah. And they shall sell them to the Sabians to a people far off, for Yahuwah has spoken it. Let's drop down to verse 17, fam. And it says, So shall you know that I am Yahuwah, your Lua, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. Verse 18, And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters. And a fountain shall come forth of the house of Yahuwah, and shall water the valley of Shittim. Verse 19, Egypt shall be a desolation, and Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah, because they have shed innocent blood in their land. For Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem. What? Let's read verse 20 again. It says, but Judah shall dwell forever in Jerusalem from generation to generation. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed. For Yahuwah dwelleth in Zion. Hallelujah.